Good morning from Dubai. Welcome to how alliancing and collaboration can transform project delivery in the GCC. This is a special webinar looking at how we can improve the way projects are delivered across the region. Uh, and today's webinar is brought to you by SNC Lavalin in partnership with Mead. My name is Richard Thompson. I am the editorial director of Mead, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, my job is to hopefully uh, manage a smooth conversation that brings out uh, many of these important points and hopefully uh, uh, helps you to to engage with these uh, with the panel of experts that we have today and with each other on on how we can rethink the way projects are delivered in the region. Um, it is a live uh, broadcast. You can submit your questions using uh, the tab that says stage on the right hand side of your screen and I will try and moderate those questions and put them to the panelists uh, and also your points and observations as well so that will help the, the conversation flow. Um, it is a 90 minute session split into two parts. The first part of today's broadcast will be a one hour panel discussion and I will introduce our wonderful panel of speakers in just a second. Uh, and once the panel is concluded after about one hour, we will move into a, a networking session. Uh, and you can all join the networking session after the panel by using the tabs on the left hand side of your screen. There is one tab that says group networking, which allows everybody to talk together in a large uh, group session. Or there is a second button that says speed networking, and that enables uh, a randomized face to face uh, networking session for anyone attending today. But the main element of today's discussion is the panel. Uh, now, the topic, as I mentioned, is about how we can rethink project delivery in the GCC and specifically looking at collaborative forms of contracting and alliancing models for project delivery. Um, across the region, uh, both public sector and private sector clients are under increasing pressure whether it's from the, the impact of COVID, whether it's the, the lower oil prices, or whether it's just tighter fiscal management from ministries of finance, there is increasing pressure on clients to get higher value from their uh, project investments. Um, and one of the main areas where we can increase value is by delivering projects more efficiently with lower levels of waste and uh, more collaboratively. So today we want to discuss how can we do that? How can we transform project delivery in the GCC to increase the value that investors and clients get from their projects, but also to uh, improve the, uh, the business model for everyone involved in the project market? So we will be looking at um, issues such as uh, what are the challenges today that we face? How is the, the project industry in the GCC today? How can collaborative models uh, move the dial uh, in terms of um, improving uh, project delivery and how indeed can we set up uh, alliancing structures and collaborative models and what are the, the roles of the different stakeholders in doing that. So a lot of detail to cover today and we have a wonderful panel which I will introduce now uh, before we start. Uh, we, uh, we're delighted to have two fantastic representatives from the, the client side of the project industry. Uh, from Saudi Arabia, I'm delighted to, uh, we have Faisal Butt with us. Uh, Faisal is the Project Delivery Director from Red Sea Development Company. Now this is if one of, if not the most important project currently underway in Saudi Arabia. It's really spearheading the, the sort of the Vision 2030 generation of Giga projects and we've seen uh, incredible uh, progress on that project over the past 12 months and I'm, I'm delighted that Faisal has been able to join us today to tell us about that project and his view of how uh, we can improve project delivery. Uh, from Abu Dhabi, I'm also delighted that we have Raymond Hector with us. Now, Raymond is the Director of Commercial Contracts at Aldar Properties. Aldar is one of the best known uh, real estate developers in the region. It's behind uh, many, many fantastic developments in Abu Dhabi uh, and has pioneered uh, many innovative ways of delivering projects and contract models over the past uh, few years. So. Thank you, Raymond, for joining us today, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your views on, on project delivery. Uh, representing the contractor side of the industry, 
Uh, we have Sean McHugh, who is the Operations Director at ALEC. Now, uh, I'm sure everybody knows ALEC, one of the best known uh, main contractors in the region, based in the UAE, uh, and very uh, prominent player in the UAE market. And uh, ALEC, uh, um, Sean will bring a, a wealth of knowledge about a, the, the state of the market today from a contractor's perspective, but also what is the role of contractors in reshaping the industry going forward. Uh, and last but certainly not least, from our, uh, from our host today, Paula Bosch is the Managing Director for the GCC, uh, excluding the, uh, the UAE and Saudi for Atkins, uh, which is a, a, one of the world's best known uh, multidisciplinary engineering consultancies and part of the SNC Lavalin Group. Uh, Paul has decades of experience in this region and around the world in multiple sectors. I mean, it's an incredible CV. Uh, and um, I know from the, the preparatory calls that um, Paul has a very clear vision for uh, the way forward for projects. So welcome to all four of you. Thank you very much uh, for your time and giving us your expertise today. So I'm going to start, uh, Raymond, with you. I'd like to start with the the client perspective, and I'll come to you first, Raymond, and then Faisal uh, after you. Uh, so from, from your perspective, Raymond, and from the Aldar Properties perspective as a client, what is your view on how well we deliver projects today in the GCC, and how do you feel we, we can change the dial to, to re reduce waste and improve project delivery? Hi, Richard. Uh, good morning, and welcome to fellow gentlemen and uh, a wider audience. Look, uh, you know, as a major developer in Abu Dhabi, we've got, you know, a very vast portfolio of products that we've been delivering, as you've rightly mentioned, you know, over the last 15 years or so. And we've been able to do that largely, you know, by the way that we work, uh, the partners that we work with, the consultants and contractors. But look, we know and we understand the traditional method of procuring and delivering the project has not really been working um, as optimal as it should be. And, you know, largely that's for a number of reasons. Um, you know, it's easy to say it's, the contractors or the consultants or whatever, but you know, the three primary stakeholders in delivery and real estate development. You, know, you normally have a developer, the owner, and we then engage with consultants to you know design the aspiration of the projects and then we appoint contracts to deliver. Now, projects in their nature, they take time to deliver. Things do change over time. Um, and then when things do change, uh, people then you know start res res resolving to point and figures and, and um, you know blaming each other. And you know, when you approach a project in that way, you don't really get a desired result. And so we see key things around with causing that lack of um, desired delivery, which is things like lack of trust, um, misalignment of objectives, um, you know, protectionism. Uh, you know, recent times we've also been going on with some of the other contractors, we have talked about you know low margins and the likes. And when you have an environment like that, you know, and, and then you've got the competitive nature about it. Every project that you do, you always go out to tender be it with the consultants and the contractors, and there are elements of competition in that. And so when you have competition, it doesn't some, it doesn't really aid for a, a collaborative environment to work in. And then again, as I say, when I mentioned things like, um, you know, tight margins, it doesn't lead, uh, you know, to, to, to the desired results. Um, and the big thing which is important for us here at Aldar as well, you know, is innovation and sustainability. Um, and those things are difficult to interject um, in the current market as it is. So, Really, uh, us as a developer, and we're, for, we're really looking for new and innovative ways to do things. Um, and we kind of see Alliance Contracted as being a key trail in able to do just that. So thank you for that, Raymond. Now, Aldar has, um, you know, has, has played a role in, in trying to innovate project delivery in the past. I think it was, was it the Al Raha Beach project where you introduced partner, a partnering concept? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what what lessons can you pass on from that experience in in actually trying to sort of transform a, 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 an established culture in terms of pro project procurement and delivery? We well, see the lessons to be, to be transforming that is it, that's it, the primary thing in any uh, partnership or, or, or collaboration. You know, it's essential to trust and, and go back to the point of you know aligned objectives. And that partnership back then, you know, it was a, a, a true sort of partnership. It was a, almost like a JV if you like. And so everyone bought into the whole thing was able to deliver. You know, if you remember back at the time, it was an incredible amount of real estate that was delivered at the time, which really sets the standard um, for, for the region at the time. And so, you know, going back to a key 
is trust and, and innovation. The way we delivered it, uh, there was a lot of you know, off-site instructions at the time um, and prefabrications that would and enabled us to deliver a significant real estate in a record time. And is it your, your sense that um, something has changed in the market? You know, obviously 2020 has been a very tough year for everybody because of, of COVID and the, the impact on the, the economy. But obviously in this part of the world, over the past three or four or five years, we've seen lower oil prices and that's put pressure on, on government spending at least. <laughs> Do you sense, uh, whether this is personally or as Aldar, um, that there is a change, you know, the, the, the need for reducing waste uh, and increasing efficiency has now overridden or overtaken the need to get the lowest price contract that you can? Well, see, the lowest price is, as, 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 as you know, uh, a private company. We we are a you know a, a, a for profit company. So so competitiveness is important to us. Um, but competitiveness cannot come at the expense of quality. It cannot come at the expense of workers' welfare, and it cannot come at the expense of sustainability. These things are fundamental to us. Um, you would have you know been re seen in the press recently. You know we've launched our RCB program. We've launched our workers' welfare and sustainability. So that those things are always very much important to us and always be at the forefront. And they never come at the expense of price. And so it's always a matter of finding a happy medium and a good balance. Um, you know, we see all partners, you know, as, or, or vendors as, as partners effectively. So we want to, we know everyone's in business to make money. This, this is just what it is. And so we feel that consultants and contractors are able to deliver when they're contracted on a price that they feel comfortable with on fair and balanced terms. Um, and so over the last few years, you know, we would have all harmonized all contract terms. And in fact, we've just done a survey recently where we've got an 85% success ratings, where we've been saying that all contract terms are fair and balanced. Um, and then on, on a price. We do believe that you know we we pay a good price uh, for the products and services that, that that we do ask for, and you know consultants and contractors have been delivering for us on, on that side. And you know, and again, one of the things that we're pushing in is the sustainability. Um, some people see this as a price premium, but um, we don't see it in, in in that way because when you go at it in the right way um, and you implement these things early on in the contract in, in, in the design phase, and then throughout the construction. It doesn't really come in as a premium, and then you deliver a quality product that the market needs um, and wants, um, and you know they pay for it at a good price. And so we see it as as a, as a fairly balanced and overall. Okay, thank you. Um, now, for anyone watching, uh, I'm sure everyone who's joining us today uh, has a keen topic. If you have questions for Raymond or any of our panelists, please use the stage tab on the right hand side to submit your questions, and I will do my best. Uh, to, uh, to put into the panelists. We already have one question that has come in uh, for you, uh, Raymond. Um, I'll put this to you now, but we could maybe, you know, we, we don't want to take up too much time before we go to the, uh, to the other panelists. But the questioner has asked, why has the alliancing approach used on Raha Beach not been replicated since? Now, that, that's quite an interesting question. I don't know enough detail myself about, about that, but is that because the market changed and so the priorities changed or did it not quite work as hoped? You know, what, what's your thought, what are your thoughts on that? Well, look, I mean, you know, the alliance or collaborative contract takes many different forms. Um, you know, we're, we're not, they're pure alliances and then there are innovative ways to doing it. Here in the region, we've been used to doing things in a traditional way. We, you know, we used to do it for the contract, we do a design, bid and build scenario. Alliance in really works and have great value for large, complex infrastructure projects when you're trying to deliver, you know, a vast amount of real estate in a short period of time, time or a project with significant complexity. Um, you know, the Halara Beach project was, you know, that was a different thing. It was, you know, effectively creating a whole new you know, neighborhood and, and area within a short period of time. So that was right for that period of time. Now, moving on from that. Um, you know, again, as I like to say, we, we work with a number of contractors and consultants on a repeated basis, and that's kind of alliance and collaboration in an informal way, if, if you like. And, and that's just then from the quality of work that we get from both the consultants and the contractors. And so uh, we see in that sense. So this, these are some of the reasons why you may not see it um, in a formal sense, uh, because when you establish a good working relationship with, with, with the supply chain, it doesn't necessarily need to have a formal contract labeling something as alliance work to be working. So this, um, this this is what I would say about that. But in generally, uh, in, in the region, 
for Alliance to really work, like I said, the, the key premise for Alliance to work is, is trust um, and uh, align the goals and objectives. Um, when you have a client going off and then you know, engage in a consultant to design a project and then engage the contractor much later on, then you, you tend to lose the benefit. You, you, know, you miss the, the boat effectively um, on getting that collaboration and your early involvement up front. Um, and, and so the, these, these are the challenges why it hasn't really been adopted in the region to say, but it doesn't stop it from you know, working going forward. Um, and we're now looking at ways and how we can do that. And again, to allow us to continue to be sustainable, to allow us to continue to be innovative, to allow us to be able to deliver quality products to the market in a time that's right and at the right price point, then we need to redefine these ways to be able to do that. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Raymond. Um, I'll move on to the other panelists for a moment, but uh, if anyone has questions for Raymond, please uh, use the stage tab on the right hand side. Uh, Faisal, if I can come to you, thank you. Uh, again, for, for joining us today. It's great to have the Red Sea Development Company as part of this discussion because your your project really is the sort of the uh, uh, blazing a trail for the, the next generation of projects across uh, Saudi Arabia. And I'm guessing that because you're all part of the kind of the, the, the Vision 2030 ecosystem, if you like, that a lot of what you do, a lot of the lessons from the Red Sea project may well um, permeate through the other projects, you know, Neom and Kadia and, and all of these ones. So uh, tell us a little bit, Faisal, about where, maybe if you can just tell us a little bit where the Red Sea project is at the moment in terms of procurement and how you feel about the current way the projects are delivered. Is it adequate for your needs and how would you like to sort of improve it? Well, thanks, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, Fair from Riyadh. Yeah, so we we operate in a challenging environment, right? So we we are operating in a remote location, right? The west coast of Saudi Arabia, between the city of Al Waj and Imlaj, where essentially there is no development in the project zone. And we also operate in a very environmentally sensitive area as well. So we need to respect that factor, which is which is very important to how we develop and how we deliver these projects. Um, so project started about three years ago when the initial vision was put together. Uh, over the course of the next following years, we finished our master plan, got our master plans approved by, by our board. And right now, we this year, we've actually procured up to four billion approximately in contracts. Um, so some major contracts awarded this year. Um, and we will continue to do that next year as well. But I think for us, the challenge has been, uh, to a certain extent, the maturity of the market. Um, delivering projects in this time scale we're trying to deliver, uh, the designs and the aspirations of the design we're trying to deliver and uh, the quality we're trying to deliver, you need to think outside the box of how you construct your delivery models, how you put your contracts together and how you collaborate with the market. Um, initially, it was always a challenge because, you know, what our job was also deliver the project, but also teach the market here of how we see delivery. Uh, but I think, you know, those were initial challenges, challenges around contractor engagement. You know, there was not enough contractor engagement, early contractor engagement in this market. Historically speaking, UAE is a different market, you know, much more mature. Um, the design management capabilities of the contractor was not as sophisticated. Um, so, and on top of that, our delivery model is design management and construction management. So we firmly believe that in order to deliver the design, deliver the quality and mitigate the schedule risks that we, we know we're going to face, um, that was the best approach to do. So we need to almost, we needed to almost rethink the whole project life cycle and delivery model. So rather than, you know, design, bid, build, uh, we, we have a much more integrated approach. Um, you know, I think over the last couple of years now, we've demonstrated in terms of our collaboration with the contracting market, our collaboration with design, with design houses. And I think now after, you know, working on this for the last almost year and a half, two years, we try, we're seeing the benefits of that. Um, but again, you know, we, we are focused on, we are focused on delivery. We are very particular about the design and the quality of this destination. Um, you know, this destination needs to set these standards in terms of how you see hospitality for the future. And, and rightly, as you mentioned, you know, this is a key component of uh, the 2030 vision in KSI. Thanks, Faisal. I, I was interested in your, um, 
a comment right at the start of your comments there you you said you know the the uae is a more mature market uh, and i just wonder if that's actually an advantage or a hindrance so one of the things we <clears throat> hear about is you know the need for culture change in the way projects are delivered and contractual relationships so in some ways more mature also means more sort of established or embedded behaviors and so you actually perhaps have an opportunity to start with a, not not a blank obviously not a blank um, sheet of paper, uh, but does that give you, because you're working on this kind of completely new type of project in a completely new area with a completely new client uh, model, that that means you can set it up as you want to? You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It does. It does. It, it does allow us to actually rethink how we deliver. And then actually, it gives us an opportunity to, train, to actually make sure that the contractors also understand how we want to deliver. I think you you're right in saying maturity kind of goes both ways so you might be matured in terms of how you deliver and what your supply chain is and how you provide logistics but you might be also very really set in the way you do things right so it, it kind of it kind of goes both ways but i think here in this market we've we've taken we've taken up the opportunities in terms of looking at contractors and contractors who traditionally have the ability to deliver but essentially haven't don't have the framework of how they want to deliver. And I think we've come in, work with them uh, collaboratively and help them ensure that this delivery goes to um, exactly how we want to deliver things. So I think uh, you're, you're right. But again, you know, you, you see the benefits of having UAE as a mature market as well in terms of supply chain, in terms of logistics. I mean, our, our partnership with Amana Dubox, I think has been very successful. Um, they have been a great partner for us. They have delivered for us uh, and they are delivering for us over the last year now. They've actually set up a manufacturing facility not too far from our project site. Um, so again, you know, Amana could do that because Amana is mature enough. They have their supply chain established, but then some other contractors, they are open to working with us uh, because let's say they are not as mature as some others in the UAE. Um, and so that has helped as well. So what you, you just mentioned the Mala Dubox there. So what you it, I may have this the detail wrong, but what you're talking about there is kind of modular uh, construction practices where things can be fabricated off site in advance. Which I mean that is a, a, a huge um, trend, isn't it? An important trend for the future of construction. But what in terms of contractual relationships and the way you know the designers and the contractors and the clients are set up, how does that modular um approach require you to change those relationships right so so i, I think you know when, when we talk about modular um you know it, it was important for us you know speed of delivery was important for us because certain certain, certain projects needed to deliver early on uh, but the design elements were very important for us as well so we deliver quality and deliver the design aspirations uh, we we wanted to make sure that our design teams, wh wherever they're sitting in the world, with our modular construction teams, are working on a single platform. So I, I think one thing which was really key uh, and has been really successful is is using platforms such as BIM 360 um, and having a collaborative ecosystem where you design, where you look at constructability. Um, we we have we have really taken advantage of this platform in how we design and essentially construct and deliver these projects. Um, we have over 200 uh, designers in house. I mean, you know, we have a large team in house uh, working with design teams around the world. And I think using certain collaborative platforms has really helped. And then on top of that, you know, in incentivization in terms of how we set up our contracts and how we deliver and how contractors and design teams um you know deliver on their milestones i think that's really helped as well um so i think that open dialogue early on setting up contracts in a way where there's a collaborative environment between the contractors ourselves as an employer and the design teams from very early on and in that that was really uh, our, our basis of how we want to deliver things uh like i said in earlier in my uh, in my notes that otherwise there's the schedules that we are delivering at are going to be very challenging so the we had to rethink that. And I think using technology, uh, using collaborative platforms has been extremely, extremely beneficial. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Faisal, uh, for that. And if anyone has questions for Faisal about uh, his comments on you know, the modular construction or collaborative contracting, 
or indeed about the Red Sea project, uh, please send them in using the stage tab on the right hand side. Um, Sean McHugh uh, from Alec, if I can come to you for the for a sort of contractor's view of this conversation, I mean, what you're hearing just now must be uh, manna from heaven. You know, you're hearing about two enlightened clients talking about early stage involvement for contractors in the design process, offsite prefabrication. I, I, I mean. Is this what you want as a contractor? The market has been tough for you. I don't mean Alec, I mean contractors generally. Um, is this what you're looking for? Yeah, uh, thanks Richard. Yeah, good, good morning to everybody. Um, de definitely, I think, you know, that's something that has been missing for a long time is actually that kind of early engagement. Um, and we've always felt as contractors that we do have a lot of value to add, you know, in that respect. And, you know, we do end up being you know, a major stakeholder in these projects when they kick off. So it's always, we've always questioned, you know, the, the, the lack of, of interface in, in the early doors, because we do believe that we can actually bring a lot of value. But obviously, you know, um, I guess from a client's pers perspective, what's happening there is you're sort of compromising uh, a competition, um, which is kind of the tr tradition in the market, you know. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, things have become quite tough of late. Um, and obviously as contractors, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys that we are right at the sharp end of all of this. Um, so, I mean, the, the, you know, the economy slowed, sentiment is pretty low at the moment. So we're seeing a lot fewer tenders, you know, there's less investment. Um, and then there's some of the sort of um, spin-off behaviors around that. So kind of default on payment. You know, we've seen quite a few big players disappearing from the markets. Um, and of course, the, the cascading effect of that, the supply chain that goes with it. And then unfortunately, you know, the individuals and the families that are that are affected. So it, it, it has been pretty desperate. And, um, and then also what we have been seeing a little bit more of is, you know, some, some clients or developers that uh, perhaps see this as an opportunity to take some advantage. Um, so some of the tenders that are coming out, we're starting to see some some quite um, uh, difficult terms and conditions being pushed down, you know, even worse payment terms than we were seeing before in terms of timing, which, um, you know, make things pretty challenging when, when contractors and the supply chain are already struggling for cash, you know, signing up to new projects in this day and age. With can, I, can I just come in on that point, actually? The, um, I'm curious to know what type of uh, if, if we can sort of separate the types of clients. So, you know, obviously we have Altar and Red Sea Development Company talking at the moment, and those are big clients who have repeat projects and a strategic approach. Um, the ones that you're just talking about where you're getting more aggressive and less attractive contracts being tendered, do they tend to come from the kind of one-off clients who, who perhaps just want the lowest price that they can get? Or yeah, I say, I, uh, yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say, is there a, you know, are we seeing a sort of different behaviours from different types of organisation? Uh, I, th I think you're right. Um, I think from most of the bigger, more mature clients, we're definitely seeing uh, recognition that there's issues that need to be overcome and uh, people trying to explore better ways of doing things. Um, so, yeah, probably more the one-off developers and maybe sort of mid-tier uh, mid clients and developers that you see more of that coming from. Um, so, yeah, but... Um, I think I think we talk about this more and more nowadays, and it's it's encouraging to see the amount of discussion that goes on around trying to find better ways of doing things. Um, I, I, I would sort of caution um, against sort of getting too far ahead of ourselves. I think we kind of got to walk before we run, um, and and sort of ask ourselves what you know what's the real reason around the issues we're facing, um, and. You know, we've had very successful projects under sort of tr traditional contractual frameworks, and we've had failures where we've tried to do an alternative uh, contractual framework. And a lot of the issues sit within, um, you know, behaviors and, um, you know, people, whatever your contractual framework is, I think it's got to say the right sort of things. And I think people need to, when organizations need to, um, take responsibility and do what's required under those things. You know, often collaboration is just a mindset. It's not necessarily the words written down in a contract, you know, which I think is is quite important. And um, I think a couple of tweaks um, go, go a long, long way. So, I mean, 
key things like having you know responsibility in the right places, risk apportionment, um, making sure that the right behaviors are incentivized. Um, and I think you know we could go a long, long way. I mean, even design and build. So our, our experience is design and build is a great delivery model, but we can't seem to kind of get there. You know, we just don't see enough of it. And I mean, that's a small step. You know, um, you know, there's been talk around the construction management there by Faisal. I think that's a great model. Uh, I think that's got legs. Um, and and I think Raymond was, you know, he was saying there's many ways to to collaborate, right? There's all kinds of different ways. And um, I, I think. That, that's what we sort of need to ex explore some of the some of the softer issues around the contract and, and and making sure you know great to talk about these sort of alternate frameworks but how do we make sure that we get the right behaviors from all the stakeholders within the ones we have you know it was very interesting just now sean when you said um it's about mindset all three of the other panelists nodded exactly and said that you, you clearly <laughs> there is a consensus that it's, a, it's not just about the contract, it's also about the attitude and the mindset. And Raymond, in his comments, he talked about trust. He mentioned it several times. And I think Faisal and you both used that word as well. So that, that's so we're, what does that tell us? If that's the bit that we, that's missing, the lack of trust or um, that comes down to mindset, I mean, how, where does that lack of trust come from or how do we create it? Is it the contractors who are too adversarial in their, you know, variation claims or is it the clients who are setting up unfair contracts? You know, how, in your opinion as a contractor, Sean, um, what can we do to sort of create trust? I think, you know, trust is like it is in life, you know what I mean? It's, you can't, it doesn't exist because you write it somewhere. Uh, it, it's, it's earned, it's developed over time and, um, and it's it's you learn to trust people because of the way in which you interact with them and the way that they behave, and and you know it comes from all sides. I mean, there are contractors in the market that don't deserve to be trusted, and there's contractors that do, um, and there's employers that deserve to be trusted, and there's employers that don't. And um, you know, I think it's 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 doing the right things. It's 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 putting the project first. You know, quite often what we see is. It, it agendas, organizational agendas, um, sometimes tend to take priority over the project itself. And I think that's where things start to fall apart, you know, and creating that the right environment for everybody to operate in and then, you know, making sure that the continual involvement from the employer to, you know, to ensure that whoever you are, you, you're playing your role, you're doing what you've yeah. got to do and you're being treated fairly. Um, that's where it's sort of, uh, I mean, a, a small example, but it's, it's kind of a killer in the market is how long it takes to deal with variations and claims. You know, financially, that's a huge burden on contractors because the work is often done and complete many, many months before you're able to agree values and get, get paid for those things, you know. And the longer they left, they culminate and aggregate and it just becomes a bigger issue to deal with. And then pe you know, people... Are more likely to then step away and not want to get involved where if these things can get dealt with in real time which is what the contracts require then you know you're in a much better place because everybody understands where they are and they can just get on with their lives and focus on delivery instead of everybody focusing on the kind of adversarial environment that that, that tends to be created okay well thank you sean i mean that's a fantastic setup for paul uh to come in and i'm going to bring in paul paula bosch uh, is the managing director for the GCC for Atkins, part of the SNC Leveling Group, uh, and you are our host today, Paul. And you want to talk, uh, um, you know, it, it boost this concept of collaborative construction forward, uh, contracting forward, and alliancing using alliancing models. So it fo follows on exactly from what uh, Sean has just been uh, been s saying. So I, I, I presume that you are in full agreement with what we've heard so far. How do we make it happen? Uh, Thank you, Richard, and uh, assalamu alaikum and marhaba. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I heard some um, um, really, um, really encouraging and, and good words um, coming out um, from, from our two client panelists and, and the contractors. Uh, the word trust is, was mentioned a, a, a number of times, and, and, and trust is fundamental. And I think it was Sean was saying, you know, it's earned. It's 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 not something that you can you can pick up. It needs to be earned, and 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 we need to get there slowly. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a great um, advocate of um, of collaborative working. 
Um, I've spent you know half of my uh, 35 years career uh, in Europe and the UK, and the other half um, uh, the other half in the Middle East, um, with a background of um, with a with a background of uh, project management. Really, um, I've been able to work across a whole number of sectors: uh, transport, pharma, defence, building, etc. Uh, and I've also been through all phases mm -hmm. of a project. I've worked with clients, seconded into client organizations as a designer, uh, looking after uh, uh, Dubai Metro and Riyadh Metro for the uh, for the contractors, looking at how we can how we can integrate design with construction to to uh, to reduce the time and deliver a better project. And also working on 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 um, on uh, as a contractor with SNC Lavalin on building a hospital. Uh, and also on the FM side, so I, I've covered really all of the phases of the project, and I think I have a good uh, understanding of how the effects of one part lead uh, lead directly uh, lead directly on to the others. Um, it basically, I want to, yeah, everybody has agreed today that um, that current delivery models in the GCC seem to be failing, uh, and there's a lot of potential there to it to improve for all of the supply chain, whether it's the client. The contractor, uh, the consultant, and even all the way down into the subcontractors and and, and the material and equipment uh, providers and delivery people. Um, basically, this is evidenced by builders becoming more risk averse, and as we heard, you know, even some are even departing departing the region. Clients need uh, uh, ever improving performances to overcome the effects of endemic time and cost overruns. Uh, and basically, they, they need to also ensure that they get the best uh, bang for their buck, given the decreasing funds resulting from COVID's effect on the GCC economies. So in order to get more projects out, we need to make sure that every every um, Durham, every Real um, spent is, is much more effective. It, it became clearer that collaboration between project owners and their delivery supply chain is much more essential uh, if we're to get the necessary infrastructure to be built in the future. I really want to just touch on, um, on, on, um, on, on one issue, I think, that, um, that, 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 that is very important to me. Um, basically, a collaborative working environment is, is one that most construction, uh, construction people want to work in. It provides a more pleasant and productive environment in which construction professionals can thrive and excel in their work. Sharing challenges, crafting solutions together as a team encourages innovation, cross-fertilization, continuous improvement, transfer of learnings. All of this is very important uh, and where you get delivery in, from a trusted and committed and motivated team. I mean, at the end of the day, who wants to go to work day after day um, really acting as a quasi lawyer, writing continual backside covering letters, engaging in constant stressful confrontations and arguments centered around blame. At the end of the day, as construction professionals, most of us chose this career in order to solve, solve technical problems and build excellent infrastructure for society to improve people's lives. There's so much more to collaboration delivery over and above uh, the aspect that I that I just mentioned. Uh, and really, I, I'd like to pick on just three features to touch on briefly and hopefully start a, start a conversation around them. I mean, the three key features of collaboration uh, that, that I see, uh, key feature number one really is, is making sure that in the early days, uh, the client's advisors and the client's different uh, parts of the organization and even sometimes different ministries need to work together to optimize the requirements. Working collaboratively, collaboratively and openly between all client departments and client advisory consultants to optimize requirements, identify the major risks that projects will face and establish clarity and consistency on client goals goes a hell of a long way towards making sure that everything that flows downwards from there uh, works much more, much more efficiently. The second issue I want to touch on really is, is one of, on, about on the design. And again, as contractors, I think, and Sean will probably vouch for, you know, getting a, a good, uh, a, a robust and well-coordinated design solves a lot of the contractors' problems. So it's vitally important that as, as, as designers, they have early access to all of the parties that have an influence over that particular design. 
And those parties, in terms of the level of their influence, will vary from project to project, depending upon what the project is. And in terms of stakeholders, you know, I, I'll just mention some examples. I mean, as Sean said, it's important to have uh, in a lot of projects, early contractor involvement, early supplier involvement, understand how the contractor wants to build, what his sequence is, um, you know, what materials he's going to use, what equipment specialist he's going to use. If the designer knows all of those issues from day one, that design will already accommodate those and the delivery of the design will be in line with the contractor's sequence that he wants to build on. Paul, if I can so ask a question on that point, because I wonder if there's a difference in, in that approach between the private sector and the public sector. So, you know, my perception is that in private sector real estate projects, the client wants to get the units out sold in the market as quickly as possible to keep, you know, to get their revenues coming in. And so, therefore, you get design construction starting before designs have been completed. But on the on the public sector side, perhaps it's a bit more strategic. So is there, on that point that you just made about early involvement and completed design earlier, is there a difference between public and private sector projects? Um, I mean, there are some differences, but I think it, it really depends. I mean, I go back to what I was saying, uh, you know, when you, when you start a project and working with the client, I think it's vitally important that the client's goals uh, are understood and, and, and made and kept consistent as much as possible. You know, some clients, whether they're public or private, will want the project completed quickly. Uh, you know, for example, oil and gas, uh, oil, the oil and gas market on close downs. You know, it's, it's vital that you get in there, finish the work and get out because you're holding up a, a vitally expensive um, product at the end of the day. You know, farmer, it's very important to finish stuff quickly because you have a ticket patent. And the quicker you get stuff done, the more money you're going to make on the back of that patent before it before it runs out. That's so, quite an interesting point, I think. So you, you mentioned other industries where there are wider factors than just the contract, the cheapest price or the lowest price wins. And Raymond earlier talked about sustainability factors and quality factors. And Faisal talked about protecting the environment and the, the, the high end development on his project. So those are factors being brought in from those particular um, project sponsors outside just lowest price. So is that is that one of the key elements to changing the culture? It's having a more holistic approach. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, by, by working early with the client to understand his goals and mapping your procurement process and the sequence of your procurement um, so that you optimize getting as much of the key information that you need for the design as early as possible with the need to get um, best commercial value out of your supply chain, you know, that is key. And, and where you are on that spectrum, depends very much on, on, on the client's ultimate goals. You know, if the client wants everything done very, very quickly um, and is willing to pay more for that, then that's a completely different structure to, to a client who actually is, you know, is, is focused on quality and focused on, on wanting, um, on, on, on wanting to, to, to get best value for, for his money, but has a little bit more flexibility time-wise. And also- Is it, is you know, it to say, pay more because my understanding is that paying more means upfront but over the whole life you pay less isn't that that's, part of that's <laughs> that's a very key point you touch on there um, um, richard you know getting getting uh, procuring your supply chain gives you gives you a price but actually at the end of the day it's your outturn cost that counts it's not the cost of what you procured um, what you procured the supply chain for and even you know you can take it even further you know a, a lot of clients um, uh, are very keen on on, the, on a life cycle costing approach. And, and you know, within uh, PPPs and, and an SPV, where you have a special purpose vehicle on PPPs, where you have the consultant, the contractor, uh, and, the, um, uh, and the operator working together, you know, it's important to get that operational information in so that you're designing something that over the 30 year period of the concession or however long the concession is, you're minimizing the operational cost. Now, you know, that's a very good early example of collaborative working, uh, a PPP, because you've got the three parties. They're, they're all equity stakeholders in the special purpose vehicle. Their fees are based on a number of KPIs, but it involves the whole life cycle of the project over a concession. And therefore, everybody's forced to work together in a collaborative manner uh, to look at, you know, how do we actually maximize 
the benefit to the client uh, and in so doing to ourselves in terms of the incentivization that, that exists within there. So again, it, it, it's, it's really, it, it's vitally important that each project is looked at um, on, its own, on its own standing. You know, what are the client's ultimate goals and requirements? What's his business case? What are the risks that that project is going to face? And how do we actually map the procurement system and the sequence of procurement and the availability of people onto that in a way that optimizes that process with the commercial process of getting best value. And I think that's where you know the client, the client's advisors working with the client at the front end make such a huge difference to the ultimate fate of the project. Um, in my in my early days, you know, of, of working in, in the major projects unit in Atkins in the UK, we we carried out a study on on why projects fail. And it was very interesting that actually, you know, the majority of projects fail because they just haven't been set up properly uh, in a way that reflects the client's requirements, the client's objectives, the way that the procurement was brought together. You know, the parties that are procured could have overlaps in scope. They could have uh, deliverables that are out of tune when the designer and the contractor actually needs them. So it, it's really how you how you approach that process by working working together as as a team. That actually gets you to 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 a very good ultimate goal, and, and I'm a big advocate of that. Okay, if I great. Just move if I, on could, to my... I know that we've um, you've got some very important points that you've already made and want to make, but we've got just ten minutes remaining on the panel, and we've got so many questions. So I'm going to go around the panelists, and I apologise; these are random no, because no. the order that the questions have come in. But uh, Faisal, how has the Red Sea? Uh, project team collaborated with consultants and contractors. So I'm just going to put these questions as they come in. So keep your questions coming. And I apologize in advance if it seems a bit random, but I want to get through as many as I can. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, what what we have done as a client, you know, we, we've taken up a lot of the responsibility, put responsibility back to us. How do we manage design? How do we manage construction? And how do we make sure this ecosystem between the contractors, the designers and us as employer works? Um, just uh, you know, a small example for um, you know, we work in an environmentally sensitive environment, right? It's, it's a challenging environment. It's a marine environment. Um, every single thing we build in that environment needs to go through an extensive impact assessment. A lot of the contractors who are operating in this market, they probably do not know how to respond to those requirements. So we said we're going to come in, step in with our team, and help these contractors go through the impact assessments, how you're gonna execute the projects, which goes through different levels of approval from the authority, and then manage that process with the contractor. So rather than saying, okay, you can't respond to it, okay, you, you know, you, you're failing on this, let's step in. So I think that, that, that stepping in from our side and that mindset that we have uh, as an employer, as a client, that let's help the supply chain deliver, incentives are aligned, if they succeed, we will succeed. Um, so honestly, that's that's been that's been our ethos, and that's been an ethos of uh, of, of the whole organisation from day one. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raymond. I'm going to put the next question to you. Now, th this may not be one that you can answer. I, I, I apologise if it's not. But the questioner is saying, I wonder if there is an allowance to integrate capex and opex phases from an asset management point of view to ensure a smooth transformation. So bringing the the front end construction with the back end operations, you know, is that something that Aldar tries to do? Or, you know, I, I apologize if it's not a question for you, but um, you seem to be the right person for that one. Well, well, absolutely. It, it is something that, that we do try to do. I mean, at the end of the day, most of the develop, development that we do deliver are residential developments and they are for sale. Um, but the OPEX side of it is fundamentally important. Um, you know, back in the days, you know, it used to be important to have a very big apartment or a very big villa. Um, more so on the apartment side, but then on the back end side of it, from a customer's point of view, then you then have a very big service charge bill, and then that then sort of be a, a detraction or can be a detraction from one of its own properties. Now, as a developer, it's important for us to find the optimal size uh, of units to take to the market um, to get the right price points so that the customers can afford. Um, and then also, it's equally important um, to then make sure that the service charge level is is in the right point price point as well. And so, for us to be able to do that, we have 100% need to take the back end to the front end, integrate that into the design, to then make sure that you know we're looking at total cost of ownership for development and total running costs 
And so it brings us back to the price point issue where we say that it's not about getting the lowest price for, for, for products. It's not about putting in the cheapest materials. And I've seen some of the questions uh, coming in from, from some of the others are talking about procurement teams need to be re incentivized and so on. Us as a, what I can say is us as a developer, for us to be sustainable, and it's not just in a green sense, um, it's also in a sustainable sense from a business point of view. You, you touched on there, Rich, back in that. As a developer, we need to continue the pipeline to go forward. Um, and so for us to be able to do that, um, there are a number of touch points, and it's a multifaceted thing. Uh, we need to have the right product, um, deliver it in the right quality, on time. We need to have the right supply partners, and I think Files will touch on one of those things. Because us as the developer, we've got a land bank and we've got expression to deliver, but without a, a good supply chain to allow us to do that, then it's really going to fail. Um, so it's really need to bring in all of that together. Uh, and then so where the, key, where the contractor comes in and the designers comes in, still on the OPEX and the CAPEX piece, is to be able to deliver a nice competitive design for the contractors to deliver on time, but also deliver a good quality product because there's no point, you know, having a very quick completion, but then you can't hand over because the units have, you know, lots of snags in it and that gives a bad customer perception. And so we want to really circumvent it. So once you've delivered on time, you deliver the quality product, then you also want to have a very good uh, competitive service charge rate. And that really means having your, your, your product designed properly with good quality material and good installations. And so it's 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 fundamental part of all of these. It's a full service. It's it's a full loop. So you don't see yourselves as just procuring construction. Your your asset owners, asset operators, and managers, uh, as well as uh, um, procurer, procurers of project. No, absolutely, we, we we create communities. We create home. Um, you know the, the name of the big company is Aldar. You know we are home. So you know when we live that we you know we we us the whole thing. Um, you know, we are delivering homes to people and saying it, it has to be right and it can't just be home for a year or for a couple of years. It has to be home for, you know, generations. And, and, and this obviously, and this really ties into a whole thing about the sustainability, both in terms of the green side of things and, and looking after the environment side, of, but also in terms of sustaining the business, sustaining our shareholders and also, you know, generational customers along the way. So this is obviously, and this is how we approach our developments. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, I'm going to put the next question. There's a couple of, quite a few questions have come in on the technology role. So I'm going to come to you, Sean, first, and then I'll come to Paul with the same question. But what is the, the role of technology? You know, we, we've gone through this uh, big data transformation uh, or digital transformation uh, in you know, the whole world. Every part of our lives has been transformed over the past decade. How important is that for improving the way projects are delivered in terms of collaboration? Uh, if I come to you first, uh, Sean, and then perhaps Paul, you've got some views on technology as well. Uh, yeah, uh, very, very important. Um, uh, Faisal was men mentioning some of the platforms that, they, that they're that using um, on Red Sea development. I mean, BIM 360, those sorts of things. I mean, these collaborate collaboration platforms, uh, you know, they're so important if they're used correctly. Um, I mean, we've we've been early adopters of all of these, and um, you know, in in past years, we've really struggled to sort of, you know, even in some cases, to get employers to sort of buy into these things. You know, we've sort of invested on in them and pushed them onto projects and provided them free of charge to employers. Um, and then there's been sort of uptake, but but today you're seeing it kind of becoming the the, the norm. Um, so you, you know, they they have made such a difference to us and. Um, and, and like anything, I guess, if they're used correctly, um, they can be very, very powerful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everybody needs to get in front of this and it's moving so fast. I mean, it's just, it's crazy the developments that are happening on a month by month basis. The new, the new sort of digital tools that are coming along and they're no longer these point solutions. You know, we're finding more and more these things integrate so well with one another that the, um, the opportunities are endless. It must be difficult, Sean, to, you know, the, the, as you said, there are these new technologies emerging all the time, whether it's uh, advanced BIM or drones or artificial intelligence or whatever. But if you're being, as a contractor, if you're being squeezed, uh, you know, late payments or a lack of new projects or what, whatever, is, how can you invest? Is it is it quite difficult to sort of find the investment for these things or is it is it not an option? You just have to do it. N not at all. Uh, you know, we, we, we started out trying to worry about you know, will this pay for itself, ROI, those sorts of things. And the more we've looked at it, it's a no-brainer. I, I mean, I don't even think about it anymore. When a, when a new technology comes along, a good digital tool that plugs into what we do, just get it and start using it. 
you know, and, and also they develop. So we're working with, I mean, some some great startup companies out of the UK with um, with program management tools and things like that. And, you know, if you get in early and you get on board with these guys, they work with you. And, you know, we, we've had so much development within that tool to kind of cater for us um, and what we do and how we do things, you know. Um, these things just, they, they move and they progress and they develop. So, yeah, we don't even worry too much about that now, Richard. I mean, if it makes sense, we do it because... It, interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting because you've heard for, for a few years, you know, contractors saying we can't invest in R&D because conditions are so tough. It's quite interesting to hear that basically you're saying this is not an option. This is not optional. You, you have to do it. So uh, that, that, I think that, for me, that sounds like a change uh, in, in uh, sort of a, a approach. And um, Paul, if I can come to you, we've just got a couple of minutes. I'm not going to ask you that question about technology because we're, we're tight on time. But there is a question here I think uh, we'd like to ask, which is who is responsible for taking the lead in collaboration in terms of contracts? So it's the kind of where do we well, start this transformation? I think at the end, you know, there, there, there is no one person that, 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 that takes the lead. But, but as it was mentioned, it's, you know, this is all about trust and it's all about encouraging people uh, and motivating them to work outside of the narrow sort of contractual silos that they sit in. You know, one of the one of the problems we have um, at the moment is that yeah, you're you're not encouraged to identify a problem. Mm. Um, uh, so so generally people sit on it, and and it eventually comes out. And when it does come out, it's much more difficult to deal with. So what we want to do is 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 you know have a have a have a level of trust and a level of openness that allows people to put their hand up and say I have a problem, and then work together with everyone else to resolve it as quickly as possible and as early as possible when that resolution is is least costly. And to do that, you know, you need to, and I think it's been mentioned by a, a number of the panelists, you need to make sure that everybody is motivated uh, and incentivized in terms of the client's ultimate goal. And this is where the incentivization element of collaboration comes into play and into how that is set up. You know, everybody needs to be set up with tight and achievable targets. Those targets need to reflect the particular outturns of the project that the client is seeking. And then you'll, you'll automatically get that collaboration and people will step out of their, their normal sort of contract silo that they sit in and say, well, that's not my problem, it's somebody else's. Uh, they'll identify stuff earlier uh, and it will, it, will work, um, it will work much better from that point of view. Now, going back to your, your question of who's responsible, you know, ultimately we need to get the, we need to get the thought leaders, uh, you know, converted within the industry, converted to this type of approach and I think, you know, by having uh, clients like um, Algar and the, and the Red Sea, um, the Red Sea development, who, who obviously, you know, have an interest in these type of contracts, they need to get together with like minded um, people from the supply chain. And it's all about creating a culture. And, you know, the, the more times the more times you do this, it, as mentioned before by Sean, you know, it will be baby steps. It might be PMB plus with incentivization as a, as a, as a first step. But the more you do that, the more confidence that is built into the system, uh, the, the further you can go. And ultimately, you can get to the type of um, uh, all singing, all dancing, alliancing that you get in, say, Australia and, and Western Europe. But we're a long way off that. And we need to build that confidence and trust. And it needs to be started by you know, convincing the thought leaders, getting like minded people from the whole supply chain to get together and say, right, we're going to use this as a pilot project. We're going to look at the WIS profile. How are we going to actually make this work in a, in a collaborative manner? Fantastic. Well, that, that uh, brings us to really the end of our allocated time for the, the panel. But it, it's gone too quickly and there are so many questions that we haven't been able to get to. So what we will do is we'll circulate the questions to the panelists after as we can try and respond to people directly. Um, there also is a group networking session, which I'll tell you about in just a moment, where we can carry on some of this conversation. But just to follow on to Paul's point, SNC Lavalin, as part of this broadcast, is publishing today uh, this document, and it's called um, it's called New Alliances Collaborative Contracting in the GCC Projects Market, and it provides a framework 
uh, for uh, um, delivering transformation in the project market in the GCC. And it follows on exactly from what we've just been talking about over the past hour, and specifically what Paul's, uh, uh, Paul's just been mentioning in his closing remarks there. Uh, so this this white paper, which is published today, it can be you can find it and download it from the snclavalin.com website. Uh, so snclavalin.com website, and there's a tab that says Beyond Engineering. So if you go to the snclavalin.com website and click on Beyond Engineering, you can download this document, which is published today. But also. Um, to talk about what's in this, if you now move to the group networking session that uh, we're going to start immediately after this panel, there will be a half an hour discussion where the points that we've not answered can be addressed and we can, Paul can talk about the, um, about the white paper. So on the left hand side of your screen, you will see a tab that says group networking. That gives you a chance, everyone who's joined us today, including the panelists, to talk in an open forum. You can all see each other. It's a, a big group session to, to meet each other and talk and, and touch on these points. There is also another tab on the left called Speed Networking, and that allows everyone who's joining us to, to just randomly meet people. The computer has a sort of randomized face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, meeting algorithm that gives you 90 seconds with somebody random who's joined today, and you can make contact and network as if it's a face-to-face -face event. So both of those things will start now. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to the, the panelists who've given us so much time and energy and expertise. So thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Paul, uh, for your one hour so far. Please, if you have time, join us in the group networking on the left. Uh, and thank you all to you, the, the viewers who've, who've joined us and sent in these amazing questions. Also, uh, join us in the group networking session. So. That's farewell from me for this formal part of the, the, the webinar. If you go to the left-hand side, click on group networking, and we'll see you in the group discussion. See you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.